Hello and welcome to the Fire in the Belly show. Today we have myself, Mighty Pete, and we are joined by the D. Neil Elliott. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening to you, sir. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Pete. It's a pleasure to be here. And, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to our conversation. I listened to a couple of your episodes and, uh, you know, good, thank, good on you for what you're doing for the world and, and helping people learn things. So. Well, thank you. Thank you. I mean, we've just passed the 300 episode mark, so we've... Uh, We've had beautiful conversations with so many people around the world and what a privilege and uh, it's great to meet new people. So just to give our listeners a bit of a background here. So, so Tony Outsider, D. Neil Elliott, it was highly educated, owned a profitable consulting firm and had a successful career and an amazing wife and family. But things were not all they seemed to be. Neil was facing a lot of challenges. In a phrase, he was in a dark place. Quite by accident, he discovered a higher road. As he traveled that road, he found the key to transforming his life. Over the course of the following year, Neil lifted himself into, sorry, to a st inner state of love, peace, joy, and abundance. His perspective on life changed entirely. His troubles and tribulations were his impetus to find the key that enabled him to revolutionize his life. He learned that the search for a better life does not entail positive thinking, saying affirmations, chanting mantras, or traveling to India to sit at the feet of a guru, or any other popularized method of finding yourself. The key to ascend in both spiritual perception and truth, you need to use the right process to break through your entrenchment human ego barriers. For nearly three decades, Neil read hundreds of self-help and spiritual books and took self-development courses. All of them offered hope for change and improvement, but nothing fulfilled his need or genuinely delivered on its promise. Neil's desire and his new mission in life is to share the knowledge he gained and the process he used on his journey of self-awareness. Together with the blueprint document he discovered that was the, what was instrumental in transforming his life. He wants to give you, regardless of your station in life, the tool, tools and opportunities to empower yourself, transform your life and draw peace, peace, joy, love and prosperity into your personal situation and environment. Neil believes that as, as more and more people follow this higher road to true spiritual perfection, a new era of love and peace will dawn for everyone throughout the world. Wow. Welcome, welcome. Listen, Neil, it's absolutely fabulous to have you on, and, and what an amazing start! And and you've you know big expectations here. It's great. I love it. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I hope they're all met or exceeded. <laughs> well, I'll start off with an easy one then. Who are you? Oh, I'm a I'm a soul on an evolutionary journey uh, to learn the lessons that I want to learn, to have a spiritual awakening, and to help. Uh, this world come into this new era of love and peace. Wow. Do is that uh, evil? Is that is that an evolution or is that a remembering of what they already know? Do you think? Uh, <clears throat> souls. Uh, is that what you mean? Is that your question? Like, well, fundamentally, do we all know it, and we just need to remember it, or is this a, is this a brand new exposure? If you like. Uh, well, there's two components to that. So we all need to remember who we really are. Uh, so our souls can remember and can have access to that. Uh, but the process of evolution for the soul is to come here in many lifetimes in varying genders, varying colors of skin, different places of origin, different religions, uh, sometimes wealthy, sometimes poor. Uh, and go through this evolutionary process over many, many lifetimes to hone and develop your unique personality, your unique expression of unconditional love uh, until you get to a point where you wake up, understand what you're doing to yourself, and you begin this process to uh, transcend your ego uh, so that you can be a, a purified expression of unconditional love to everything and everyone here on this planet. And when you leave that lifetime and your body returns to dust, it's ephemeral, your soul steps into the light and it will not need to be reincarnated again. Wow. So there is, this is a, this is a one-way journey, but has 
many, many stops on the way through, right? Many times you're going to be here. But, you know, the good news is the, you know, where we come from and our, and our destination is all the same. It's a one-way ticket. It's just uh, the, you know, trials and tribulations and stuff that you experience on the way, which help shape and hone your uh, personality. Have you any perceptions of how many times you've been here before or previous incarnation? Uh, so I have been told it, it's in excess of 500. Yeah. Wow. And do you have any perceptions of any of those previous journeys? Uh, you know, back in the 90s, I did. Um, so we'll talk about some things, but. Back in the 90s, I, I tried to change my consciousness and I, I picked up spiritual books uh, and, you know, things by Tony Robbins, Napoleon Hill, uh, Wayne Dyer, Carolyn Meiss, those kinds of books. And I was reading them and I was trying to go through this process to shift how I thought. And uh, as part of that, I did three or four past life regressions. And so if what I learned in those past life regressions is truth, then yes, I have some sense of it, but I can't say for sure, you know, what I learned in a past life regression is, you know, just my, uh, human ego imagination kind of creating these things or whether it was actual truth. I, I can, I cannot verify the validity of the past life regression. Sure. Sure. It's, it's just perception, right? It's, uh, our version of a truth maybe. And that's yep. all about it. So how, how is your ego? Let's just, let's just start there. Um, let's say that one more time. How is your ego? How is it doing today? Oh, um, you know, I'm still, so I'm a work in progress. This is not a uh, instant gratification process. Uh, you know, I have a lifetime of ego baggage to uh, discard and dissolve, to dissolve and discard. And so it's this uh, progression. Uh, it's a process that uh, you need to go through uh, to uh, you, you wake up and you, you start going through this process. But, you know, it takes a while to discard and dissolve these things. We have programmed our subconscious mind uh, with these uh, egoic uh, thinking behaviors and responses to life uh, since, you know, childhood that we've reinforced over a lifetime. And those things are really embedded. They're like concrete. And in order to break those up and dissolve them, you need a, you need some new knowledge and you need a very specific process to go through to break them up and dissolve them. And uh, so that process happens uh, slowly, sometimes very imperceptibly, but it does happen if you stick with it. And um, if you were to be able to change all of that immediately, the the, the danger is this, subsidence of uh, self-confidence and it may lead someone to suicide. So this process of doing this happens slowly uh, and, a, and in a progressive fashion and you, you, you just shed these things. And as you're shedding them, you know, you just become lighter and lighter and you become more of this embodiment of unconditional love. So do we do we start off clean and clear, and then we we layer it up with loads of stuff, uh, and then we spend the rest of life trying to shed the stuff to get back to what we arrive with? Is that is it? So, <laughs> um, okay. So uh, I'll answer your question specifically. So you come here with um, a lesson plan, if you will. So, you know, this, this earth is a school and you come here with certain things that you uh, want to experience and want to learn. Your soul does. Your soul's infused in the conception process uh, and the little eye mind of ego is created at the same time. And uh, the little eye of ego um, takes control of building the body uh, over that nine month period using the genetic plan that uh, you know is in our genes and using the life force energy that flows throughout the universe. And as you grow from babyhood to about age five, at around age five, a little bit later, um, your brain develops where you can individually make conscious decisions and make choices. 
But up to that point, you're really just this sponge. You're absorbing everything in your environment, uh, your parents' emotions, uh, their language, their religion, their culture, their environment. So everybody you come become exposed to. So you came in with a plan of things that you need to learn. Then you get layered on by your culture and your, you know, your gender and your exposure as you're growing up uh, to babyhood or to age five or so. And that starts to shape your personality for that lifetime. Then you start to make conscious choices of your own. You are continuing. Now you have more exposure by going to school. You meet more people. You have more experiences. You're, you're continuing to shape it and hone it. And as we grow from babyhood to adulthood, we think we're becoming versed in the ways of the world. But really what we're doing is we're shutting our soul off from the light and we're getting bound down by the um, egoic uh, responses to life uh, driven by the ego. And so in every lifetime, you know, until you begin this process to wake up every lifetime, you are learning things, you're experiencing things and things that you do not deal with spiritually in one lifetime, you will create a mountain of things that you need to deal with in the next lifetime. So there is so, an overall cache, if you like, that we're, we're processing through this uh, mountain, let's say, of, of things and through the various lifetimes and for yourself, potentially in excess of 500 lifetimes to each time to is a process or to understand a different emotion a different aspect or a different part of us is that is that a fair so so um good question so um okay uh i'll just i'll do a little bit of overview and then we'll i'll answer that question so um when you understand what was before the big bang the impetus for the Big Bang, and then what happened at the time of the Big Bang, and how the tools of the material universe were created to enable us to experience the things that we that we experience to create physical form, and then how we use those tools moment by moment in our lifetime to create every event and every experience that comes into our life. Then you get an, uh, an understanding of how we are using our creative tools ignorantly, unknowingly, unwittingly to create every event and every experience that comes into our life. So as we go through a lifetime and we're ignorantly creating these things or unknowingly creating the stuff that comes to us, we have these ego reactions that uh, we kind of... Um, might reinforce and and continue to build upon or at some point we might start saying you know i no longer want those and you go through a process to wake up and to be able to shed that kind of stuff and um now that i've told you that background i forgot your specific question which i was going to answer next <laughs> um no it was, it was along the lines of you know just the fact that we're coming into each of these lives we're, we're processing a different part different part of the, the 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 you know this we're, we're trying to each piece of the jigsaw on each lifetime saying this time i'm coming to process this part and this time we're coming to process this part i mean is there a central cache overall oh so okay so yes yeah, so thank you for reminding me of that um so now i'm going to give you my impression of it and you can't take this as truth this is just my impression for what i know and so uh we come from unconditional love and we return to unconditional love and every one of us, so your soul is a fragment of the um, unity or the unified consciousness of divine consciousness. So you are one fragment and you are this unique fragment uh, to experience things that you want to experience that are uh, contrary to unconditional love. And so we come here and we create all of these experiences that we take back to the divine, back to the unified state of divine consciousness to create this richness of experiencing itself. So, you know, there's this phrase of, uh, I don't know if I'm not, I'm not religious, so I can't speak to the Bible, but um, I believe there's something in the Bible that talks about uh, 
uh, that, you know, God wanted to experience itself. And so this experience of itself, so you can imagine, uh, let's, you know, whether you call it God, whether you call it the divine, whether you call it the Tao or Yahweh, doesn't matter, whatever you want to call it, source of our being. Uh, if, if that state is totally unconditional love, then anything contrary to unconditional love, it couldn't experience without, without cr- doing this creation that we have now that we see in this material universe to bring these various experiences and feelings back to the divine to create more of a richness of, uh, of this experience. And so your cash that you come here, you come here to shape and hone your individuality. It is only through lessons of suffering will the journey and soul, uh, gain self-knowledge to retain individuality after it's discarded the ego. So until you go through this process of honing and shaping your personality and then gaining this self-knowledge to discard the ego, um, you know, that's how you can go back to the divine and retain your individuality. And so it is this evolutionary process to do this. That might not have made sense to you. I'm, there's I'm, a lot to, there's going to be a lot here. <laughs> I, I'm hanging on by my fingertips here, you know, and I'll, I'll do the best that I can. And that's just, yeah. that's, but no, I, 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 I love that, uh, that aspect. So, I mean, if I'm hearing this correctly, the ego is also part of us it's, and it's not a sinister part of us, if you like, because people see egoic behavior is not good. It's a negative part of us or whatever, but it, it, what I'm hearing is it's almost like a it's the captain of our ship, if you like. It's not necessarily who we are, but it's a, it's a useful guide that comes with us through this perception. Or, or have I completely okay? No, 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 not not bad, not bad at all. The um, so the ego is a tool to create individuality out of the wholeness of the divine. The ego is a divinely ordained process that uses the uh, tools of electromagnetism to create every event and every experience that comes into your life. Your creative tools are electromagnetic in nature while you are here. Your thinking is an electrical consciousness plan. So you think with electrical impulses in the brain, you feel with magnetic impulses in the nervous system. Your thinking is an electrical consciousness plan. Your feelings, be it a, um, you know, loving, kind feeling or a hateful, vengeful feeling is electromagnetic in nature. And we'll talk, we can talk more about this. But um, you, everything that you think, you then have a corresponding emotion that you magnetize that consciousness plan. And over repetitive thinking and feeling, you magnetize it to a point where it will attract into your life a like experience or like event. And because there's this lapse of time between, you know, your thinking and your, um, and your feeling, and then this manifestation of this like event or like experience, we never link what's actually coming into our life as something that we have created. If it's something good, we think, oh, that's great. You know, if you're talented and you're drawing all this wealth to you or fame or fortune or good, good things into your life, you think that you're the, you're the creator of that. And you are the creator of that, but you think that you, you do it all with your, you know, your brilliance. And in reality, it is this electromagnetic nature of this. And anything that bad's come into your life, you think, oh, you know, bad luck, or I'm, I'm a, I have bad luck, or boy, that was a chance event. And, you know, I'm really bummed about that, whatever, however you're thinking, but you created those as well that came into your life. And all of these events and experiences that come into your life, are to teach you the lessons that you want to learn that your soul wants to learn. So <clears throat> as you grow anything that is contrary to unconditional love, denigration, judgmentalism, slander, enmity, you know, all of these things. And there's a list that uh, a fundamental list, and then you will have your own other ones as you go through this process. But there's a fundamental list that you need to start with to cleanse yourself of in order to get back into alignment with the divine. All of these things that are contrary to unconditional love, 
um, will bring all of these negative experiences into your life. Anything that is consistent with unconditional love will bring um, other things into your life that are, uh, you know, in alignment with uh, the divine. So it'll, you know, bring happiness, it'll bring um, joy to others, it'll bring peace to others, those kinds of things. And uh, so, you know, as we go through this process, and you may have a lifetime that you come in and, you know, you're you're blessed with wealth and, you know, it's a happy, it's a joyous lifetime. And, you know, you learn some things and you experience some things that you take back to the richness, to the divine, but that lifetime in itself might not be the impetus for you to wake up because it is when people go through these um, dark periods or the uh, negative experience, this is when they start asking questions like, what's the point of life? Why am I here? Um, you know, uh, there seems to be no purpose, no matter what I do, I can't get ahead. And it's those kinds of questionings, like there's got to be some bigger purpose to life when when things are going well, and your coffers are full, and you've made a lot of money, and, you know, life is good, and you got your three cars and your four houses and your, you know, your, your yachts, you know, you think you're the creator of all that, and you're going along and, you know, you're, you're sunk, you're bound down by your riches by your wealth. It is, um, they're the kinds of people that, you know, when things are going really well, you don't ask those questions about what's the bigger purpose of life. It is when you get in these dark periods or, uh, you know, you're living on the street or, um, you know, you're in these periods that you don't like. Those are the times when you start asking these questions. And when you start asking these questions, then you have the opportunity to understand that life is not a journey without life is a journey within all the safety, the peace, the security, the love, the joy that you are looking for, it's all inside of you. It's not without you. Everything that you see is merely a reflection of your beliefs. You change your beliefs, you change what you see. But in order to change your beliefs, you need to have a process um, to do that. And that's what my book is about. It's about um, giving you this new knowledge, this new understanding of consciousness, a new concept of consciousness, uh, and then giving you this process that I went through that helped me understand the fundamental, lay the foundations to accept this new knowledge that I learned and gained that enabled me to go through this process, this inner journey that brought me uh, back to begin have this spiritual awakening just going to get a drink of water. Yeah, no problem. And well, it's probably a great time actually to introduce your book here because, you know, for the benefit of our listeners, you know, you have this book out and, you know, it's called a higher road, cleanse your consciousness to transcend the ego and ascend spirituality. So I love this. And this, this is just released relatively recently. Well, last year in 2021, uh, yeah, 2021. Um, and just to really sort of say, well, one, it's it's amazing out there, and I know it's a deep story, so it does cover parts of your own story. It also covers, um, you've the, the book is broken into five parts and taking you through various different sections and chapters, right? And so it's that yes. perfect. So, you know, and you talked in your book there at the start about, you know, the book almost being traveling through you or have i picked that up correctly it's almost it's 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 not necessarily from you it's through you have i picked that up correctly um uh can you just clarify that question a little bit more yeah so i mean it's it's so my 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 picking up was along the lines you know people say you know this is my book um but the sort of the perception I got was actually this is almost messages you've either received or observations you've made outside of yourself and then have detailed through the book. Oh, I see. Um, yeah. So let me describe the five parts in the book. And I think that will help answer this question or clarify this question for you. Yeah, please. So, uh, so the book itself, my recommended way to read it is read it cover to cover, understand the process in its entirety and then make a decision for yourself. If it's something that resonates with you, go back, go and start with some of the science material that I introduce or start directly with step one. It's a seven step process. Um, if it 
doesn't resonate with you, then if you bought a print copy of the book, I ask that you please just pass it on to somebody else without any colorful commentary and let them discover that process for themselves. Uh, because, you know, we're all great actors in our environment. We can we wear these facades, we can project whatever we want to family, friends, clients. And, uh, you know, we may be quite affable and kind and considerate on the outside, but inside we might be a, a misery. And so, you know, in order to, you can never accurately judge the inner reality of another person. So you never know who this process is going to help. And I can tell you, it will can totally transform your life if it makes sense to you and you follow this path. So part one of the book is an overview of what you're going to learn. Part two of the book is a very candid memoir of my life. And it's a, not a long one, but it's a, you know, gives you the full range. And it explains exactly how these patterns of thinking and feeling that I adopted, and I use specific examples in that memoir, um, uh, that I adopted and reinforced over a lifetime took me to this point, brink of suicide. Uh, part three of the book uh, is a section on consciousness, my new understanding of consciousness. Uh, and I use uh, things based in science, being an engineer, being a professional engineer. I like things that, you know, kind of can be observed, measured, calculated, those kinds of things. So I needed something tangible for me to lay this foundation for me to accept uh, this new material that came to me in this fortuitous fashion, I call it a blueprint document that I share in part four. And part four is really to introduce the reader to take you. So part three takes you through uh, laying this foundation and opening your mind to be able to receive this information, this blueprint document. And in to receive that blueprint document, you need to come to it like a little child full of curiosity and wonder without any prejudgments. And if you can do that, then you can go through this process to learn this new knowledge and then make a decision for yourself of whether it's something that, that resonates with you. And in part five of the book is uh, my personal experience as I uh, went through these seven steps. So that, so when I say, you know, I'm merely the messenger, you know, this is the exact process I went through based in science. And then this new information that came to me in this fortuitous fashion that, um, uh, based in science as well, but bridges this gap between spirituality and science that has never really been shared before. And, um, this is why I wrote this book. It's, it's to get to lay this foundation for people to give them the opportunity to, to have this foundation laid in science, which is understandable and believable. And, um, and they will understand the concepts and then introduce this new material, which without being in the state I was in, I would have run from it. I wouldn't even consider reading it. Which interestingly sort of almost, as you say, what is it? I can't remember the quote, but it's along the lines, you know, whenever the, the sort of the, the, the pupil is ready, the master will appear. And, and almost what I'm hearing here is if you are ready, this book will make sense and it will resonate and it will be the guide that you're looking for. If you're not, pass the book on, you know, and that's and there's, there's no good nor bad. It's just just not your time, right? Yeah, no judgment. There's no good. There's no bad. There's no right. There's no wrong. There's no judgment. It's just if you're ready and you can understand it and it resonates with you, then it can be what will change your life. Uh, interesting. I mean, I, and I don't know, some people talk about, you know, the, the, the conscious part of us being the masculine part and the subconscious part of us being the feminine part. And I don't know whether you subscribe to that or not, or any feelings on that, but I, you know, I find it interesting. You've taken almost your engineering world, you know, and, and your, your background there, the sort of needing to have things <laughs> nicely, uh, you know, sort of nicely sort of uh, packaged and understood. And then you've taken it to the, what I'm going to call the spiritual world. Is that a, is that a fair word for you? So, Oh yeah, totally. So you, you brought the two together, right? So you, uh, as, as I've understood it, it's the blueprint, you know, to take one 
side, the, the conscious part of us, the masculine part of us that wants to know how, and the feminine part of us, the, the, the sort of creative part of us, and said, well, it's not for us to know how, it's just for us to accept, but you've actually managed to marry the two. Um, so um, I'm going to use different language than you, than splitting the masculine and feminine like that. So, um, so I'll give you a little glimpse of some stuff. If you follow all seven steps, you will understand what I'm talking about. So what I'm going to talk about right now might seem a little bit foreign. Uh, so first is that uh, we are not matter imbued with consciousness. We are consciousness made visible through the vibrational descent of electrical particles. Everything that you see, touch, feel, know is consciousness made visible. So you think this body is solid. You think the wood behind you is solid. Those books are solid. But you know in science, you know this today, that uh, every element at a subatomic level is really just energy. So uh, before the Big Bang, uh there's universal consciousness and it is in silence and stillness and in equilibrium it will never be pro it will never be discovered by science it will you cannot probe it and they will not be able to find anything because it's in equilibrium and it's in silence and stillness it is opposing impulses these opposing impulses is will and purpose uh the will to move out uh, with the purpose, will to move out and create with the purpose to give form to that consciousness plan and experience it. At the time of the Big Bang, those impulses were, were torn apart and we see them in the material world as electromagnetism. So electricity is a movement. It's uh, photons and electrons and it, and it moves and purpose is uh, magnetism, bonding, rejection, uh, attraction, repulsion, bonding, rejection. So, you know, in science today, that, uh, so to answer your question, will is uh, the male aspect, so to speak, and purpose is the female aspect to give form to creation and experience it. So the ego is, is a tool uh, that uses electromagnetism to create these bonds and to, for you to experience things, uh, so you think with electrical impulses in the brain, it's a consciousness plan, it creates a blueprint. You magnetize with will, and uh, using either attraction or repulsion, you magnetize that blueprint that creates this like event or like experience that comes into your life. So I describe this in my book. In 2011, I did something every day for a year that uh, unknowingly, unwittingly, and ignorantly, I did this, but I did it every day for a year. And what happened is I won a $60,000 hardtop Lexus convertible. I thought I was just lucky. Later in the book, I describe exactly what I did every day for a year and these consciousness blueprint that I put together that magnetized this Lexus into my life. We do this with everything in our life. So the experiences that I had in my childhood that I've reinforced, you know, I, I adopted these patterns of thinking and feeling that created these uh, experiences that came into my life that drove me to this brink of suicide. And so the ego is this tool to create form using the tools of electromagnetism and then also the tool that we use moment by moment. So when you think about the ego, just going to grab another drink of water, excuse me for a second. Talk about the, the ego is one of my favorite subjects. So <laughs> this is always a great one for me. I love it. So <clears throat> the ego um, can only use the forces of electromagnetism to create experiences in your life. So it, its purpose is to, um, you know, is to create, uh, draw everything into your life to make you happy. So to give you, you know, to, to ensure survival. So food, 
make sure you have water, make sure you have food, draw those things into your life. And it gives you a sense of protection uh, through rejecting things that you don't like. So, uh, you know, safety, security, all of that kind of stuff. So on its own, if you were the only person here in, in the world, and there was nothing else uh, that you could affect negatively, you could draw everything you want to your life and it would have no harm on anybody else. In when there's other people involved, so if you do something today that is selfish and greedy and uh, slanderous and uh, denigrating to others, what you're doing is you're creating this rebound, rebound blueprint doc, uh, blueprint of a future event or a future experience that will, uh, will rebound to you to create this experience into your life. When the ego is used on its own to um, draw things into your life, so let me back up. So if you think about it, uh, everything that you like, you know, you, I like that house, I like that car, I like that kind of food, I like that person. That's all, those are all bonding things to draw through to you things that you like. Things that you don't like, I don't like that food, I don't like that color house, I don't want to go to that event, I don't like that person. Those are all things that you push away, you reject. Those are the two mechanisms of the ego. So <clears throat> you want a new car, you have this, you know, great car that you want to get one that you've been dreaming about. So you go out, you work hard, you set a goal, you get the car. And you get this car and you're really happy about this car. You're excited about having this car. And then after a while, the novelty starts to wear away. So you show it off to your friends, get a little boost for your ego because, you know, hey, I got this new car. And they're going, oh, yeah, nice car, you know. So you feel good. But after a while, that, that new possession becomes mundane and boring. So you set another goal. You go out, you get whatever your next thing is. That is life. That's what we do. We just continue to set these goals. We're trying our soul is always prompting the ego to go back to where it came from, which is unconditional love. But the only mechanisms the ego has to either create the safety and security is to reject or to uh, draw things to us by bonding with things that it likes. And when you can actually understand these mechanisms that we use through this bonding rejection, then you will start to be able to, to um, look at your life and understand these things that you're bringing to you that that you think is creating happiness for yourself really is just amassing a bunch of stuff that you get tired of and and uh, bored. So as you grow older, you know, typically most of us gathered a bunch of stuff over our lifetime, our garages are full, our closets are full, our attics are full <laughs> of all kinds of stuff that we thought was the best thing since sliced bread and then we no longer use. All of these things were brought to us because we think it creates happiness and, and health and prosperity and gives us one upmanship on somebody else. You know, I got this new car and they don't have that, you know, whatever it is. And um, really what your soul is trying to do is wake you up to understand that all of that safety, that security, that prosperity, that abundance, that love, that joy that you are looking for, it's inside of you. And what you need to do is go through this process to make this connection back with the divine. And when you make the connection back with the divine, the di divine will flow into you and it will help you with this process. And I can tell you, your life totally changes. I went from being deeply depressed and suicidal to a year later being totally full of love and peace and inner joy. I, the more things I get rid of, the lighter I am, the happier I am, the stronger my connection with the divine, um, the happier I am, the more joyful I am, the more uh, prosperous I feel, the more abundant I feel. Everything that you are seeking is inside of you. And you just need to understand this new knowledge and go through this process to make this connection back with the divine. And when you do this, your life totally transforms. When I see someone today, I see, uh, I see their soul, their soul is equal to my soul, their soul is perfect, their soul is unconditional love. And anything that they're doing that I may consider to be reprehensible, is really just these mechanisms of the ego, this tool called the ego, that is creating the, the events and experiences in their life to teach them the lessons that they came here to learn, to get them to finally wake up. And when they wake up, they'll begin this process too.
that that waking up is that the aspect of seeing your own reflection so actually as you say it's it's not seeking out it's seeking in it's it's that aspect of saying as you say it's it's, it's all within you you don't need to go anywhere you don't need to read the book you don't need to you know search or find the next guru because all the answers that you need are contained right all the all the answers your soul has every answer that you need but what you but what enables you to go through this process is to understand um these processes uh that we use moment by moment that create every event in our experience so let me give you another let me give you an analogy so <clears throat> method actors so uh method actors you know they they dress the part they speak the part they act the part they eat that way whether they're on film or not because they're really trying to get into that role and then when the uh, director calls action you know they're in the role they um they they have become that role that that individual and then when the director calls cut they can step out of that role and back to what they are now a current example of this is will smith at the uh <laughs> the academy awards where he went into this method acting and he became this method actor, but it has lingering effects in his consciousness, right? So then he got up and did what he did. And, but the thing is that, you know, conceptually actors go into this. Heath Ledger is another one. You know, Jack Nicholson told him that this is a really dark role playing the Joker and you gotta be really careful with it because it will really affect your psyche. And uh, then Heath Ledger ended up, you know, dying from a drug overdose, right? And um, <clears throat> so we are born, our egos take control, and we become, we're these method actors that don't understand our reality. Our reality is our soul. This is just a tool. This is a rented vehicle, this body. And the thing is that, um, you know, we never step outside of that and go, oh, wait a minute, I'm just playing a role. I'm just learning lessons that I need to learn. And that I actually have this control of uh, whatever it is that I'm doing. And if I can keep that control consistent with unconditional love, with all of the things that, um, you know, are in this uh, unified divine consciousness, then, you know, my life will be entirely different. And that is really that inward journey that gets you to this point to realize that we live in this duality. Excuse me. And so it took me to really understand that it took me more than a year to do that. Now, when I started this process, um, you know, at about the seven month mark, I started to feel this tingling at the top of my head. It was about the size of a dime. I didn't know what it was. As I carried on in this process, um, that tingling got bigger and bigger. And at probably about the nine month mark, it was about the size of my fist. So maybe four or five inches in diameter. And at that point, I knew what was going on was I was building new brain cells impressed with new knowledge at the top of the head under, under the top of the brain underneath the skull that operates at a higher vibrational frequency our source of our being is so spiritually refined and uh, operates at such a high frequency of vibration it emits unconditional love to all of creation all the time but our human consciousness is at such a low vibrational level that it cannot enter into it into us and make itself known to us and so we start to go through this process to raise our, raise our human vibrational frequency of consciousness. And as you do this, then what happens is a spiritual energy will start to flow in through your head. At the 12 month mark, you know, that had grown quite a bit larger, probably the top of my head, all of my head. And the energy would flow in and then it would flow uh, down one side of my body, up the other side of my body would be in my head or my chest or my solar plexus or flow throughout my entire body. At the 13 month mark, I went into a meditation two days apart, I had two of these. And uh, the energy flew in, uh, flowed in through my head, filled my body and then just totally enveloped my body. And I was in the state of 
and we don't have the human language to describe it, but the state of pure, blissful, unconditional love. I felt non-judged, uh, no matter what happened to me in the past, whether somebody had done something, I didn't care. I didn't care what I had done to anybody, what anybody had done to me. I didn't care what aches and pains my body had. I felt just totally bathed in unconditional love and non-judged. And I had two of those back to back. And as soon as I had those two experiences, I knew that what I had learned was truth. I knew that what I had learned was our reality. And then that has been this ongoing spiritual evolution and um, progressive awakening over the last four year period. And it just keeps getting better and better and better. And that opening today, you put a bowl over my head to the bottom of my ears. That's how big that opening is today. It's just, it's, it's fascinating, isn't it? I mean, you, and, and you probably, you can never unsee what you've seen or unfeel what you feel, right? Oh, it's like, I have an entirely different, like all the stuff going on in the world right now doesn't bother me at all. I know there's a purpose to it. I know, look, things that you put in motion individually through your thinking and feeling must come into manifested form things that we collectively put in motion with our collective thinking and feeling will manifest. It must manifest. It is the law of cause and effect. And so you think about, you know, what's happened in the last 50 years of, you know, uh, the newspapers, the, the kind of stories that are in the newspapers, the films we watch, the books we read, you know, all the violence and the murder and the degradation and the conflicts and you know uh, the political stuff that's going all of that stuff which is at contrary to unconditional love it creates these events and experiences that come into the world into our communities into our cities into our countries and around the world that are just getting more and more negative the stuff that we watch on tv you know has become our reality of people being murdered in the street. You know, you can imagine, you know, a hundred years ago, people, you know, uh, things that are happening today that we just slough off. And a hundred years ago, people would be shocked and outraged. We've just become so desensitized to it. And then we, we you know, we start reading more and more books with, you know, murders and mysteries and, um, you know, degradation and revenge and, you know, hate and, you know, all this vitriolic outrage the wars and stuff that are going on but all of this is designed to help us wake up and we're going to either self-annihilate or we're going to wake up and individually you need to change your consciousness to come into the state where you want to express unconditional love to everything in your environment regardless of what they're doing because you can see now that you know this this reprehensible behavior that somebody's doing is not their soul. Their soul is equal to your soul. Their soul is perfect. And the reprehensible nature that things that they're doing is really just their ego um, doing these things to create the experiences in their life. Now, because it's a reflection of what you see, it gives you the opportunity to heal something in you that needs to be healed. Because in reality, you should not be judging anybody to be different than you because they are an aspect of you. And so, you know, <clears throat> as this whole world, as we individually change our consciousness, then our collective consciousness will start to change and create these events of harmony, peace, love, joy throughout the world that will eventually spread around the world. But all the things that are already in motion that are going to be negative, that we consider to be negative things, are still going to happen because it's a law of cause and effect that cannot be avoided. But how you view it and how you experience it when it's happening will entirely change. You will no longer be fearful. You will no longer be scared. You will no longer feel threatened. Like I used to be afraid of death. Like before, you know, before I was 57, before I was 58, I used to be afraid of death. I didn't want to die, like scared of death. Now, now it's like, I, I would, not that I would welcome it, but 
I know that it's going to be a transition to something even better. So I'm not afraid of it. And I, and it's inevitable. It's going to happen mm. Can't escape death. Well, I normally say it's death and taxes, but I mean, <laughs> I don't know if taxes are even that, but I mean, certainly death for you. What's, what's your take on law of attraction then? Well, law of attraction is this electromagnetic um, nature of the universe that we use to create these blueprints that draw every event and every experience into our life. Hmm. And, every, and when I say every event and every experience, I mean every event and every experience. When you understand that every thought you have is a consciousness plan that will create something that rebounds in your life, you start to pay attention to what you're thinking. What, you know, if you think what you feed your body, the nutrition you eat is important for your body, I can tell you that what you feed your mind is more important for your overall health and well being and the well being of this planet than what you feed your body. When you understand this, you will stop consuming the material and the things that you are used to consuming that are contrary to unconditional love. For example, I don't watch anything on TV or listen to anything on TV that, um, that I would have enjoyed 10 years ago. Uh, you know, now if it, if it's not, you know, um, if it's not consistent with something that's uplifting and joyous and peaceful, I don't watch it. Don't pay attention to it. Don't feed my mind it. Don't read those kinds of books. I just stay away from that stuff altogether. It, it, it's interesting because I, I do, and I, I kind of, I kind of understand, I think. Um, and, but there's so many people who are, for me, quite, um, certainly quite aware, let's put it that way, but yet they get so frustrated with the world. They get so uh, upset about what's happening in the world. And I suppose my, my thought, and I'd be interested in your, your reflection on that, is like, well, that's, that's then you judging the world. That's then you then having a perception of what should and shouldn't be, which is outside of your own consciousness. Surely then, as a, as a conscious being, you should just observe it and say it is without perception, without, you know, without judgment, without judgment. Yeah. Now, yeah. now it's something that um, I'm not going to support or engage with, you know, I'm not going to do any, okay. So I'm still a work in progress. That doesn't mean I'm perfect. Okay. So my ego still wins many, many times but I'm now aware of when my ego steps in and is winning in a, you know, trying to position itself to win in a, in a conversation or an argument. You know, if you are defensive in any way, that's your ego, my friend. <laughs> if you're trying to defend yourself or you're trying to do one upmanship on somebody, that's your ego. Unconditional love is unconditional love. You know, you see people for everything. So we're doing things, which is going to, you know, uh, be harmful to this planet or harmful to other people, I will not engage in that. I will not support it. However, I recognize that when people are doing things that are harmful to other people, it is part of just this process that they need to go through to create these like events and like experiences. Now, that doesn't mean I'm going to support it. And it doesn't mean I wouldn't um, have to be careful about that when I say speak out against it. I wouldn't speak to judge the other people. I would just say, you know, my wife would, she would say something like this, uh, you know, 10 years ago, for instance, uh, I would say, oh, that person's a real asshole. Can I say that on this? Sorry about that. But that person's a real jerk. No and my wife would say, you know, you're really be, you know, you're behaving like a jerk. She's not calling the person a jerk. She's not judging the person a jerk. What she's doing is saying, Hey, your behavior is very jerkish. You know, don't, don't, you know, that, do you understand that that's what you're doing? So she's not judging the person. She's just saying that your behavior now is contrary to what you should be, you know, how you should be behaving. So you have the opportunity then to change it. 
where I personally would have judged them. Yeah. And that's, that's subtlety, isn't it? I mean, it's like people say, you know, I am, I am afraid. It's like, no, you, you're not the representation of afraidness. It's like, I am feeling afraid, you know, or you, you are acting afraid or you're behaving afraid. Right. So, and it's almost like, yeah, he's a jerk. He's like, mm, pretty sure he's not the global representation of jerkism. Um, <laughs> but he's doing some jerkish things, which is, it's different. Right. So it's, it is different. It is different. And it's, it's, um, so I'll give you another example. Um, during this pandemic, two people that I know, uh, were two women and, uh, they're walking down the street and they're coming upon this historic building, uh, that, you know, the entry was on the second floor. So there's this large uh, set of steps that go up to the second floor of this building as they were approaching the base of that building. So no one else is on the street as they're approaching the base of that building, um, this, uh, older woman came out at the top floor and she's really, uh, animated and, uh, gesticulating wildly and, and quite angry. And, and she stared down at them and said, you can stare all you want, you know, in kind of a really angry, nasty voice. One woman, she goes, Oh my God, this woman's a danger. I'm phoning the police. So she pulled out her cell phone. She stepped back. She dialed 911, which is, uh, what happens here in North America. <laughs> and, uh, uh, the other woman, she goes, she, in her mind, she went, Oh, I wonder if she needs help. I wonder if she's okay. So she reached out and said, are you okay? Do you need help? And as soon as she did that, uh, the women up on top of the second floor went, Oh, you know, like this is what's happened. And she explained herself about what was going on. The only difference in what those two people saw was a reflection of their beliefs. And so the first thing, so when you go into this uh, part on consciousness, this, this section on consciousness in my book, I explain and I use some uh, uh, other references there to explain consciousness. And then the first thing that I had to understand that everything that I believe to be right or wrong, good or bad, true or false, is really just a belief. And I had never really understood that before, you know, because I know that this is right, this is wrong, this is good, this is bad, you know, science doesn't lie, this is right, <laughs> you know, that's, but really, it's just a belief, whether it's accurate or not, gravity, we know affects us. I'm not saying that gravity doesn't exist. I'm saying that it affects us here in this material world, but it still is just a belief. We believe it to be true. Gravity is true. And then you can say, well, I can document that. Sure, you can, but we still, we believe it to be true. It is just a belief. And as soon as you understand that what you think is really just beliefs, you have this opportunity, and I go through this process I went through, to actually uh, describe how and why then I could actually fundamentally get at this programming that I programmed in my consciousness as a child and then reinforced over a lifetime to change those beliefs. And when you can change those beliefs, you open yourself up to the truth. And when you learn these things, and I call them truths because I now believe them and know them to be truths. Now, there's still a belief, but they are consistent. And I've had this spiritual awakening since then. So I'm going to say that these are truths that you're going to learn. And um, as soon as you know this, then you have the opportunity to start changing those beliefs. And as soon as you can change those beliefs, then you can open yourself up to um, have this spiritual awakening. But for it's but it's this process you have to go through that breaks up and dissolves this programming. So I'll give you another analogy. This body is like a rented vehicle. This body is like a self-driving car. Your ego, you know, is programming this 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 self-driving car. So you you think consciously, and then you have these uh, subconscious programming that you have programmed over a lifetime that you have immediate reactions to and you have a corresponding emotion with that right and so it's like you're programming the self-driving car your ego's in control it's programming the self-driving car and what you need to do is you let you need to get your soul to gain mastery of the driver's seat and to start to change this subconscious programming and in order to do that um, you need a process that gets in there that first will start with understanding that everything that you have programmed is really just a belief. 
And then you need this process to break those beliefs up, uh, to dissolve them, to cleanse yourself of them, and then to rebuild those beliefs with a set of beliefs that are consistent with where we come from, which is unconditional love. And when you do that, then you begin this process to uh, kind of unwind these beliefs, dissolve these beliefs, get your thinking and feeling in alignment from where we come from and let your soul gain mastery of your life. And when your soul gains mastery of your life, it starts to, your ego then becomes your true defender. It's the thing that will help you jump out of the way when you're going to get hit by a bus or give you that feeling of don't go down, you know, that alley because that something just doesn't feel right. Um, so that becomes your true defender, but it will never then, you know, you will get to a point where you go through, you become this expression, this embodiment of unconditional love and everything that you seek, everything that you want to manifest, you can manifest because you can do it deliberately, but you will never ask for anything selfishly or personally. It will always be from this spiritually enlightened center where you're asking for things that are good for your community, for your country, for the world. And that's the kind of stuff where we need to get to. That's where we all need to be. How, how do you get to it? Or is, is that, is that, is that the book? That's the, that's the seven steps. That's, that's, that's the book. Yeah. And, and it might not happen in this lifetime, but you can begin the process. You know, so I use this analogy too. <clears throat> in um, 1994, uh, so I have an engineering degree. In 94, I was thinking, oh, I should take an MBA. So I'm in my mid 30s. I was born in 1960. So I'm in my mid 30s. And I was thinking, oh, I should take an MBA and I'll, I'll work and I'll go to school at night to take this MBA. And I was debating, oh, do I do this or not? You know, kind of that's a, that's a hard juggle, right? Go to school plus work full time. And my wife said to me, well, how long is the MBA? And I said, it's two years. And she said, well, <clears throat> time's going to pass anyway. So two years from now, you can look back and say you did it. Or look back and say, you wish you'd done it. So it's the same thing here. I'm going to give you, if you read my book, I'm going to give you the tools that will help you uh, enable you to begin and to embark on this consciousness cleansing, this connection back with the divine. When you understand these tools, you'll make a decision for yourself. You know, if it takes a year or two years for this to work for you, you can then make that decision of, do you want to do it? And two years later, you can look back and say you've done it, or you can say you, you wish you've done it. Same thing. So I'm going to give you the tools. Uh, I'm going to give you the process. I'm going to give you access to the new knowledge. And, um, and I can tell you that it works and I can tell you that it's truth and I can tell you that it's real because it's happened to me. And, but it's going to be your choice. Would, would the, the pre 57 year old version of you and your version now, I mean, would they even recognize each other? Obviously you can back recognize, you can recognize your older self, but would your old self recognize your new self or is it just, that was just far too, you know, it's, it's light years apart. I think I probably, no, I don't think I would recognize. I would have said, no, nah, I could never get there. I can't believe that that could happen. Don't know how that person is doing that. If I've done my math right here, that's that's five years ago, right? So I started in I started this process in November 2017. So call it 2018. So I had those two unconditional love meditations in late December 2018. So it's been 19, 20, 21, and we're partway in 22. So yeah, so four years. Are, are the people around you going? Neil's kind of lost the plot. <laughs> just, <laughs> just, just stick with him. He's 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 just changed. He's different. <laughs> um. <laughs> so there's probably two versions of people around me. There's people that, um, 
recognize that I've changed and see it as a good thing and understand that they would like to do it too, but they have not yet embarked on that journey. And then there's other people that probably have, you know, are kind of more in terms of what you've just intimated there, <laughs> which was a, a cute way to say it, by the way. So, and I'm okay. You're going to, you know, I mean, this is the other thing you are going to, you are going to change, you are going to shift. And I can tell you, it's so much better. Like you just, because your whole perspective and view of the world changes so drastically, or at least it did for me, I can speak to the eye, but I, I suspect this is going to be true for a lot of people is that, you know, my wife says Neil has a new tribe. That's the way she describes it. That's you know, just the, the people, some of the people that you used to, you know, kind of uh, hang out with, you may no longer want to hang out with them. Hmm. It's, it's a reality because they are so, for lack of a better term, they're so unawakened, you know, you want them to be that and you, you want to help them get there. And so you will express unconditional love to them, uh, to try try and help them wake up. You're not going to tell them what to do. You're not going to try and push your beliefs onto them. It's not your place to push your beliefs onto them. They need to come to it. So you need to be the expression of unconditional love and be this beacon of light. And, it, and people will be attracted to you because you're this a beacon of light and they will be curious about what it is that you've done. And those people that are curious, then you share. If people are not curious, then just hold your peace. It's not your place to try and push your beliefs onto anybody. It's it's quite funny. I mean, I I have had the joy of interviewing a lot of people, and that's not I I I'll speak to anyone. I really don't mind, and I have utmost respect for everyone until they start telling me what I should do, and mm -hmm. I find it quite interesting when people go from the point of sharing their views to telling others you know saying i i've seen this you should do that and it's like well that's uh that's an interesting perspective right it's part of their process yeah yeah it's not to be judged it's just you know it's just it's just they have um you know they have experiences that are going to come into their life that will help them uh when they're ready so, and that's okay. We all do it. Hey, look, you know, I've sure I've had lifetimes where I've done totally reprehensible things. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's not, it's not to be judged. It's just, it's this process, this evolutionary process of the soul. So, you know, you come into a lifetime, you know, imagine your soul uh, dives into a, uh, a pond of green dye and it comes out quite green and it's educated to, to uh, and culturally and religiously educated to live a green life the next time it comes in it dives into a red pool and it comes out you know to educated and culturally educated to live a red life but it's red life mixed with green and then it dives into a blue pool and so on and at some point you wake up and then you start to go through this process to shed the red shed the purple shed the blue shed the green until you step out into the light and then you don't need to be reincarnated again so we all do this. It's just, it's just, it's part of this evolutionary process of the soul for you to, uh, you know, hone and shape your personality to be this unique expression of unconditional love. So when you go back to the divine and you don't need to be reincarnated again, you are this unique expression of unconditional love, this unique expression of God, if you will. Just that even that aspect, and as you were speaking there, that I suppose separating your your I suppose your it's not your truth, separating the fact that you know, and separating the, the story that you use to carry it, separating those two alone is going to make your life a hell of a lot quieter, right? Or your mind a hell of a lot quieter because if you stick to purely what we know and not what we've heard or believe or perceive or watched on TV or whatever, right? That would be a bloody good start for everyone just to 
mind their own business right you know to 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 be mindful of what they're doing how they are present right absolutely so you know we let our externalities drive our life we're always responding to whatever is happening in our environment and when you learn to do this journey inside so you're going to learn a meditation when you go through this process where you're going to be you're going to and this is where I was talking about the audio, where we were talking about before we started to program this about learning by audio books. So, you know, you need to stay focused. So you're going to learn a meditation where you actually go into the silence and the stillness of your mind. You stop all thoughts. And when you go into the silence and stillness, this gives, this gives the opportunity for the divine to, to start to enter into you so you can build these new brain cells and with new knowledge and then make this connection with the divine and when you were in the silence that's when you have this strong connection and 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 you get this spiritual inflow of energy and direction and inspiration and guidance and and i tell you you just you're you you're so full of inner peace and love and joy it's just meditation becomes like the you know your most precious time during the day and then what happens is that you will meditate more and more. So, you know, you may start with 10 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes in the morning, whatever you start with that works for you. I can tell you that I meditate for 90 minutes to two hours every morning without fail. It is sacrosanct. But it is now moved on to I meditate at night. I go to bed. I meditate when I'm in bed. I wake up in the middle of the night and I will have a meditation. I'll have this strong inflow of spiritual energy. It becomes this point where you know you not only become you know you you you're working to get to this place where you're always in every moment of every day in this silence and the stillness and you just become this purified channel of unconditional love that comes from outside of you and through you it is just it is i have you know i'm not there yet i'm still working on it right i have a lifetime ego baggage to get rid of and uh but it is such a beautiful process it's like and when you begin this process and you start it you will you will just carry on because it is so enlightening it is so amazing it is so like you just view the world differently you view what everybody's like i don't need a bunch of stuff i don't need all this stuff you know like material goods mean nothing to me now wealth is not what you own, how many cars you have, how many houses you have, how much money you have, you know, your, your fame and your, and how many accolades you have. Wealth is all inside of you. It's just this, it's this inner peace. It's this love. It's this connection back with source. It, and it's totally amazing. And if we were all in this state right now, the world would not be in such a shocking state that it's in right now we'd be looking to help each other. You know, we wouldn't be looking to denigrate or hurt or harm or, or judge other people. We'd be looking to help and uplift. We'd be looking to care for. Is, is there change happening? Is there change coming? There's change coming. So the world's in this new dispensation of energy to help people begin this process and to wake up. But like I said, Things that are already put in motion <laughs> through our collective thinking and feeling is still going to come into manifested form. There may be many horrors that are coming that we consider to be horrors. I'm no longer afraid of them because I know our truth. I know where we're, I know where I'm going to end up. And it's not a, you know, it's not a concern for me. What I look for now, I look for how can I best experience this? How can I best learn from this? How can I help other people be comfortable, not fearful. And I still have, you know, I have these little nagging fears. I explain all of this in my book, but you know, like I, I grew up with, uh, you know, fears of chemicals and fears of, you know, like phobias and anxieties. And I still have some of that stuff. I'm still working on getting rid of those things. They're all, and I know they're erroneous thoughts, but you know, they are so embedded and they are so, uh, they're like, you know, it's like this, it's concrete, it's reinforced concrete with rebar, <laughs> you know, so it's like, they're really hard to break up, but I, but I can see it. It's, it's happening. It's, it happens slowly. It happens imperceptibly, but it's happening and I'm shedding them. I'm getting rid of them. 
And so whether I, 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 I step into the light at this lifetime or whether it's another lifetime or two lifetimes from now, I don't know, but I'm on the process. And I can tell you in this lifetime, I am way more happy and peaceful than I've ever been in my entire life in the last few years. But I no longer look back and, and um, feel regret about anything because I know everything that I created in my life that I considered to be negative was all this process to get me to this place to awaken. And I'm joyful and happy about that. It's just part of the experience. I sort of almost hear it's like a 57 year dress rehearsal to actually, <laughs> <laughs> to actually come on stage now. Right. You know, that's, that was just, that was all the rehearsal that had to be done to, to get here. Right. Uh, in this lifetime, you know, if, if I've had 500 lifetimes, there's been lots more. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. Sometimes you say it's like, yeah, I'm a bit of a slow learner. It's taken God <laughs> many lifetimes, you know, I mean, you know, but your, your soul is infinite and eternal. So 500 lifetimes, you know, if that was 5,000 years, that's nothing hmm. to infinity, to eternity. There's a, um... There's a simplified theory that because I, I, I love language and I love I, I love just more listening to people because words are, you know, as you intimated earlier, it's like sometimes there's just no words, but we, we try and throw a word at it. We try to throw something that we know at it. Right. And there's a simplified sort of overarching theory or hypothesis I have, and I'd love to put it in front of you and uh, get your, your, your thoughts on it. And one is, I suppose, that the the um it's it's all about communication and when we talk about outer knowing for me is it's almost the, the language of the ego when we talk about thinking you know when someone thinks something that's the language of the conscious mind when we talk about feeling you know feeling is the language of the subconscious mind but still has some ego and then sensing is really the language of the soul. So whilst the simplification, you're saying if you want to know how someone, you know, what they, they really feel or think, ask them what they feel or what they sense, if you want to actually understand the true version of them. Does that resonate with you at all? Does that make any sense? Um. Yeah, I, I don't want to be contrary um, for, you know, for, so I'd have to think about this a little bit, but I'm going to say this is that um, the ego, like we live in this duality and the ego is everything that's expressed, thinking, feeling, subconscious, because of subconscious programming. Your, your ego binds down your soul with thongs and chains. So selfish, greedy desires, uh, denigration, slander, these are all bondages of the ego that shut it off from the light. And so depending on the evolutionary process of the soul in that particular individual, some of them may be currently driven by ego, but be more in touch with what their soul is actually prompting them to do. So if it, if whatever their soul, so here's the, here's the key indicator. If whatever they're feeling, uh, what their soul, whether it's a message or whether it's a feeling, if it comes and it's consistent and congruent with unconditional love, it is from the soul. If it is contrary to unconditional love in any way, it is ego whether it's a feeling or whether it's a, uh, a thought or whether it's an outward expression. So, you know, you know, we talk about, you know, people can put this facade on. So I could be quite nice and kind to somebody, you know, so I'll go back to a future life. I'm nice and kind to somebody and, and respectful in the conversation inside. I might be going, this person's an idiot. They don't know what they're talking about, but I'm putting out to them that, you know, um, oh yeah, no, I can agree with what you're saying, or I can understand what you're saying. So this is all ego at work. I'm consciously trying to operate in my environment 
by being polite and pleasant, but inside I'm thinking this guy's an idiot. And, but it's your thinking it. So every feeling and every thought, every word, action, and deed create these events and experiences that come into your life. If you are thinking this person's a jerk and they have no idea what they're thinking, that is going to come back to you more than you having this facade of being nice and pleasant and kind. Because this is this, this thinking of this negative aspect of this person, this judgment, judgment on this other person is the thing that you're going to reinforce. This is the blueprint that you're going to reinforce. It's not the kindness that you put out to them. It's the blueprint that you think about. And then you have this emotion associated with that, whether you've programmed a loving motion with it or, or a, a hateful mo uh, emotion with it. So that is still going to do that. Your soul is bound down and cannot, it's always prompting the ego through the psyche to go back to unconditional love, to, to be this expression of unconditional love. But because your ego can only work through these forces of electromagnetism, bonding and rejection, it's still using these things until your soul starts to gain mastery over your ego and is actually saying, you know, your ego might be going, that person's a jerk, but your soul gains mastery and goes, no, <laughs> they're not a jerk. They're equal to you. And you want to be consistent with unconditional love. Now I'm simplifying, but you want to be condition. You want to be consistent with unconditional love. So ego, go sit down, you're benched <laughs> and your soul gets mastery out of that. But your ego is over there on the bench, just waiting to jump in uh, at every interaction that you have. And you have to keep beating it back. Your soul has to keep saying, no, go sit down, go sit down, go sit down. And eventually you know, your, your ego kind of gets tamed and, and is over in the corner and then only jumps in to protect you when you need to be protected or, or, you know, safety and security, or maybe draw to you. But you know, you'll, you'll, your soul will always be, you know, you have one piece of bread and there's five people and it's the only food that you have. Your soul is going to say, you know, please take this, share this. And maybe you share it and everybody gets a piece. Your ego is going to go, no, it's all mine. Right. Mm. I mean, is, there is that perception, and I think it's what of Eckhart Tolle and talks about that, you know, just the ego cannot survive. And if you are purely present in the now, you know, that the, the ego has no ground to set upon. Um, d d does that concur with you? Does that? Is that well, I th so, so I think this now this becomes a language thing where I would need to understand because um, Eckhart Tolle, you know, I haven't, when I read his books, they didn't resonate with me back in the nineties or, you know, even, you know, 10 years ago, they didn't resonate with me. So I, you know, Wayne Dyer was someone that more resonated with me than Eckhart Tolle and uh, Eckhart Tolle is a, uh, you know, great person and obviously a, a really respected spiritual leader. So it would depend on what he means by that, but I can tell you what I mean by it. If, if the, if being in the now means that your soul has mastery and your soul is the expression and your connection with the divine is that expression, then yeah, your ego is benched. Mm. It is benched. Do you, do you, do you characterize your ego? Do you have, I mean, I have a, I have a beautiful picture of a friend that I may have of a chimp and I, and I sort of, in my mind, I see that as, you know, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm needing to have a chat with my ego in the third person, it's sort of this this chimp in a bikini that I mentally I've formed. I mean, do, how, how do you view your ego? Do you? <laughs> do, I, I haven't created a mental picture for it. <laughs> it's just I can recognize when it's jumping in and then I'm, you know, I'm, I'm working to let my soul be the expression instead. Let my soul express itself versus let the ego express itself. And I can tell you, it takes, you know, so this material that I share in this process I share will give you all kinds of um, processes, tips and tricks and give you not trips into uh, not, not tricks, but it will give you examples of how, you know, your ego um, can, will be expressing itself. So it gives you clues in terms of being able to recognize when your ego is jumping in. And it takes time to actually kind of digest this because, you know, again, we've programmed this stuff so deeply and, um, you know, we believe it, we've spent a lifetime reinforcing it. 
it just, it happens like in a nanosecond, right? Like, you know, that you can consciously have a conversation. You think about it. You think about your words. You make a choice on your words. Your ego probably has an immediate response. And sometimes it's, you know, your words are going to be consistent with that. And sometimes your words that you express externally are, are contrary to what your ego is saying. But you have programmed your subconscious mind and your ego. They, they are always going to respond in a, in, a, uh, in, a, in, a, in a flash, in a moment. And it's you gaining this mastery of this. And then, but just not changing it on the surface, on this what you say, it's actually changing your beliefs. It's actually changing the subconscious programming so that you don't even think that anymore. And that's the stuff that you need to do. You know, all the other stuff is window dressing. You need to get at this subconscious programming. And um, it's got nothing to do with anything in external environment. It's got nothing to do with wealth and cars and fame and position that you have, you know, from uh, everybody's equal from clerk to president, from, you know, floor washer to king, you know, so, you know, we're all equal. Your soul is equal of everybody else. And some of the people, you know, if you look back at, uh, you know, Victorian era or something like that, the, the nannies, or if you will, if that's what they call them, that looked after, you know, the wealthy's kids with care and love and attention and true love and attention on those kids, they probably grew spiritually quicker than anybody else because they are just being this expression of unconditional love, caring for these children. Do they have, you know, great position and do they have great wealth? No, they didn't. But what they were was they were the embodiment of love. You know, and so they probably grew spiritually qu more quickly in that lifetime than all the people around them that were wealthy and kings and, you know, all the rest of them. It's got nothing to do with position. It's got nothing to do with power. It's got nothing to do with what you own. It's all inside of you. That's your journey. How, how do you, how do you sense check something that it's not, hasn't got egoic behavior either obviously or, or or sort of surreptitiously disguised in there that actually it's it's egoically driven or egoically led i mean is, is there a, a sort of a litmus test to to help to identify the, those sort of potentially sneaky maneuvers um there's some of the overt ones that you'll be able to use a kind of a intellectual litmus litmus test on but other ones it takes time it takes practice it takes self you know you are going to go through this process of this um critical assessment in terms of every thought and every behavior you have and um you know quite frankly it can get tiring sometimes right but what you can do is when you go into meditation you can ask for help you can ask for guidance you can ask for support and it and it will come rushing to you and it will tell you and it will support you. And so you have this, you know, it's bigger than a note. You have a universe full of uh, support that can come and it can help you if you let it in and if you listen. But the key is you have to let it in. You have to be, you know, you have to be at this high vibrational frequency. But when you're there, then you still have, you have free will. You can do whatever you want. This is part of the process is to, you know, free will gives you the ability to make your own choices, to create your own things in your life. And the goal here is to give up your will, your, and let the divine do its will in you and through you. And so every way well, you have free will, there's no right, there's no wrong. You're, the divine may say do X and you go, no, I'd rather do Y. You can go do Y. <laughs> but I can tell you that it will create some kind of rebound form that will eventually lead you to the fact that, oh, you know, okay, I need to pay attention here and just follow. And when you give up your will and you're willing to let the divine do its will in through you, there will be bigger and better and more prosperous and abundant and fun and joyous and loving things that come into your life than you ever dreamed possible. But it's a process. It, it takes energy it takes time it takes effort but it's well worth it it's it's everybody will get there this lifetime or 100 lifetimes from now everybody will get there 
but uh, you know, I can say, Hey, look, in my book, I give you all of the tools that I used and all of the process I used, and you can make your own decision. Just read a higher road cover to cover. Makes sense. Go for it. Doesn't make sense. Please pass it on to somebody else. What, um, do you, do you have any perception of where this is going to go? What's coming out there? Or is that, is that none of your business? Um, where what's going to go? Your life. I mean, life after this book, you know, now that the book's out there and creating ripples, do, do you, do you, do you have a perception of what's next or what, what you would like to do or? I, um, so there's a second book percolating, but, um, but, you know, I'm willing to, I'm just waiting to be inspired to, and give direction about what I'm going to, what I'm, what I should be doing and, and when I should be doing it and how I should be doing it. So I'm going through the process and I, I am working to let the divine exercise its will in me and through me. And I will go where it tells me to go. And every now and then my ego jumps in and says, no, I'm not going to do that. And then, you know, I, I carry on with, <laughs> with creating these rebound forms <laughs> and I slow the process up, but I try not to, I'm trying to really let go and really just uh, follow the, follow the inspiration that I'm given. And this book was, I can look back now and say, this was all divinely ordained. You know, I needed to get to this process. I needed to lay this foundation. Uh, this foundation needed to be laid in science for me to accept this new material. It came in at the exact right time for me to accept it. I needed to go through this process to get where I got. And then this book is the outcome of that for my expression of how I can help other people, um, you know, transform their lives and come, you know, fulfill their true purpose in life. Your true purpose is to, you know, we are not here to please God. We are here to express God. Your purpose is to express God, but you need this process to get there. And there's other processes that will work for other people. Um, but I can tell you that I can tell you absolutely that this one works. It's got to resonate with you, but it'll work if it does. And if you follow it and you do the work, you can't shop it out. Can't hire somebody else to do it. <laughs> you got to do it yourself. <laughs> what uh, do, are you still involved in engineering? Do you, how much, how many, how many traits of your, your pre pre 57, your, your dress rehearsal, uh, are you still involved in, or is it, has this been all encompassing for you, this transition? Um. <clears throat> So I was still doing engineering project management up until end of May, 2019, no, 2020, end of May, 2020. And, um, as a result of COVID, my work slowly dried up and, um, I haven't engaged back in that, uh, work yet. And I don't know if I will. Uh, if something comes along to me and a client needs some help and it's something that I would like to do and I'm working with a bunch of people I'd like to work with, absolutely. Cause, um, I had some good, I worked with some great people and did some great projects. Uh, but that's not where my verve is anymore. I, you know, my, I'd like to, you know, I'm on this journey for myself. It's a very, you know, I mean, this is a very selfish journey for everybody, but you got to take it. It's not that it's selfish in that, uh, same as narcissism, egotistic selfishism. It is, it is selfish, uh, in that you have to take this inner journey, but when you take this inner journey, you become this, you become more in alignment with unconditional love. And you, you express this unconditional to love to everybody, because what you're really doing is going back to being able to be in service to everybody, but from a place of not just being in service, but really being this, this embodiment of unconditional love to uplift and support others, which is, you know, where we all need to be to bring this world into this new era of love and peace. Mm. I mean, is that, that day you're getting principles really? It's, you know, it is that love and it's that peace and, you know, 
that I mean, if, if we were to describe them as core values, I take it they, they, that would be them. Yeah, absolutely. It's this, it's this, it's a, it's a, it's a journey to become the embodiment of unconditional love in, in complete congruency and alignment to allow the divine to be an expression of itself through me, through this body, through this rented body, through this vehicle. There's a curiosity I have in, in terms of, you know, how, and it is from my ego, it's, it's, it's asking this probably, it, it's along the lines of, you know, how, how do you, you know, sort of saying we have future goals and, you know, things I'd like to do and all the rest, but yet that maybe is not divinely the, the lesson or the path you need to take in this lifetime, you know? I yeah, well, I think there's, uh, you know, and I cut you off there. Do you you want to finish that? No, no, or... no. It's just that that okay. aspect of, you know, how, how do you how do you monitor or measure, you know, sort of personal goals, success, and and but also be present and be guided as well. You know, it, can the two coexist, cohabit? Oh, absolutely. So you know, so I guess a couple, and I'm going to say this a couple of ways, so that, you know, all of the abundance and prosperity. And the safety and the security that you are after is inside you. And there's nothing that says you should not be totally happy or wealthy or, or uh, prosperous. But that wealth and that prosperity, um, the happiness will never be at any other living entity's uh, expense. Not another person, not an insect, not a plant not an animal, not a fish. So, you know, everything from a hornet to a hippopotamus has a strong sense of I-ness. It is part of this ego driven tool. Everything has a, everything that's alive has a soul. Everything that's alive is a, is an aspect of self. You are unified in divine consciousness. Everything is consciousness. Water is consciousness. And um, it's, it's when you are doing things that, call, that harm another through your actions, that is what creates these rebound forms to come back to you. So you can have a goal. You might come, you might be very talented. Like, you know, you might be a great musician. Um, you know, I don't, you know, pick something, but you know, maybe you're a great musician. That doesn't mean you shouldn't pursue that because you can bring beautiful music and, and joy and laugh and dance to people, you know, music that people can dance to and have fun to, but you never do it at the expense of another person. You never do it at the expense of another living thing. And, um, what you create will magnetize to you. So if, so the more you give and you give with love, the more that will come back to you. But if your giving comes from a center of, oh, if I give, I get something back, that act of giving is tainted by your self-regard. And so nothing will come back to you. So when you give, you give because you want to give, you want to help to someone else. You don't expect anything in return. And this is not just an ego thing that has to actually come from your core, come from your soul. You are giving because you want other people to be blessed because you want to help others, not that you're expecting anything in return. But when you become this embodiment of love and giving just for the sake of helping others, then things will come back to you. You will be prosperous. You will be abundant because that is the law of cause and effect. It is the law of attraction, if you will. I don't know. Did that explain it? Yeah, it, it, it did. It did in many ways. It's, you know, what, I suppose what I'm, what I'm hearing is, and, and for me is, you know, it's, it's almost a code of conduct as opposed to value set, you know, and, and it is that thing is never at the expense of another. So if almost the values are the principles by which you live, and, and it, it is that sort of almost one of love, well, if you were living by love, living as a, as a value set, you know, that's who you are, then you wouldn't do it. You wouldn't hurt the, you know, the, the hippo anyway, you know, you, you wouldn't want to, you know, 
if, if that makes sense. So I think, yeah, yeah, no, it does make sense. And, uh, and so, um, you know, if, if you are a pure expression of unconditional love, it, you know, you might call it a, a value set because we like to label things, but I don't know whether we even need to do that. If you're a pure expression of unconditional love, you give unconditionally, you support unconditionally. And like I said, we don't have the human language to describe it. Um, but, you know, in my book, I share a near death experience by another author that um, had, you know, she was suffering from an aggressive cancer over a four year period that left her body riddled with tumors from her waist to her head, uh, some of the size of lemons. And they, she had these open weeping lesions in her skin. At the end of this four year period, her body weight had dropped from a normal body weight to 75 to 90 pounds. She was on oxygen 24 hours a day. She couldn't lift her head. She'd required 24 by seven care. And she fell into a coma. They rushed her to the hospital. The attending physicians told her husband and family she wouldn't make it through the night. And uh, she woke up 24 hours later, declared she'd be okay. 24, uh, within two weeks, they couldn't find a trace of cancer in her body. All medically documented. They don't know why. They just call it a spontaneous remission. But her book describes what she experienced in that 24-hour period. And she has some really great descriptions of, you know, what she did experience and things, you know, some of the things she experienced were that, you know, we come from love, we return to love, we're not judged after death. And um, that she felt like she was becoming part of everything in the universe. So she describes it as consciousness is imbued in everything. And I've told you earlier that that's not true. We are conscious. Everything is consciousness. We are consciousness made visible. So, um, you know, in that description, you know, she, she says the same thing is that she, we don't have the human language to describe what she actually felt this, in, this embodiment of unconditional love, totally supported, non-judged. And those are the two meditations I had totally supported non judge I just wanted to stay there forever. I didn't care what aches and pains my body had. I just wanted to stay in that state forever. And that's just a glimpse uh, uh, of what we return to. Just a, a, you know, probably just a little tiny taste of what we return to. And if you can be that embodiment of that, then this whole self-regard, this, this narcissistic, selfish, greedy behavior that we feel in our ego driven bodies, um, like that's not even on the radar. And so what you're doing is you're just being this expression of trying to support and love everybody, no matter where they're at and everything. And so, you know, I would say it doesn't need to have a, a label on it as a value set. It just is. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So um, I'm not saying labeling it's wrong. I'm just saying, Every time we label something, we leave it open to interpretation by different lexicons of different people of different language of different dictionaries. <laughs> so I'm try I try to be careful about labeling. It was my truth and my experiences and your truth and your experiences and connotations, languages, dialects, whatever. Yeah, it's 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 brutal, you know. And um, yeah, that author is I think it's it's fabulous in her book is is wonderful in you know, the way she describes that sort of. You know, that whole near-death experiences and i've been lucky enough to have several people on here with near-death experiences and <clears throat> excuse me it's almost that inability to to describe it it's this you know ethereal light this just other place really you know which is um i don't know i suppose it depends on everyone's perception but to me it's it's quite heartwarming to know that there is something else there you know well, and, and when you go through this process, you'll not only intellectually know it, you'll actually know it. And so then the fear just melts away because you will experience it. You have to enter into it. And when you enter into it and it being a capital I T it, our creator, when you enter into it, you feel it, you experience it, and then you know it. And when that happens to you, I tell you, your life just changes yeah, your whole view of the the world and what's going on just changes it's just it's amazing it's 
you know, I just, I don't have the language. It's magical. It's beautiful. That's <laughs> please do it, you know, but I know not everybody will because not everybody is ready for it. Sure. It's just part of the process. So. Okay. Too, right? Yeah. Yeah. If you were to describe your fire in your belly, Neil, for all of this in one or two words, could you, what would they be? You know, it's this, it's, it's spreading this knowledge for me at, at this point in this part of my um, journey, it's, it's, I want to spread this knowledge with people. So, and this process so that they have the opportunity to experience what I've experienced. You know, I want to help as many people as I possibly can come to this because the more people that, uh, you know, go on this journey, um, you know, we'll bring this whole world into this new era of love and peace. You know, the division in the future, whether it takes another millennium for this to happen, I don't know, but the division in the future will not between, be, be between the wealthy and the poor. The division of the future is going to be between consciousness. So those that are conscious and awake and understand and those that don't, that are going to be ego-driven. And so the more people that we can bring into this consciousness, awareness, this understanding and have these spiritual experiences, we will start to change the momentum of uh, consciousness around the world and throughout the universe. And it'll bring us into this new era of love and peace so that we can be this embodiment. You know, the earth was really supposed to be, as, a, as originally imagined, supposed to be this this embodiment of unconditional love to allow people to come here and really develop their personalities and hone them and be this expression of their unique individuality of, of unconditional love. Unfortunately, we've let our egos take control and we're here where we're here. You know, we're, we're at where we're at because of our own design. Nobody else's fault. You know, anyway, I could go on and on about that. So, well, it's fascinating though, too, isn't it? Because it's almost like, well, that's the lesson we need to learn right now, you know, and, and it just is, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, and I don't. You know, I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, we could self annihilate. I'm, I'm hoping not. I'm, I'm thinking not. I'm hopeful that more of us wake up because of uh, all of this dispensation of new energy and the momentum that is starting to build and gain to help shift this. But I know that what is already created in consciousness through our collective consciousness will come into manifested form. So um, I suspect things will get a lot worse before they get better. Watch this space, eh? Yeah. <laughs> Tell us where, where can people learn more about you, Neil? Where can they find out more, get a copy of your book, hunt you down, track you down, stalk you, any of the above? <laughs> so uh well let's do the book first. So the book is called A Higher Road, Cleanse Your Consciousness to Transcend the Ego and Ascend Spiritually. It's uh, a seven step process to inner peace, joy, love, abundance, and prosperity. It's by D. Neil Elliott, the D being the initial to my first name. The website is dneilelliott.com. A real easy way to get there is a higherroad.com. Uh, all social media links are on there, although I'm not a big social media link person, but. <laughs> Uh, books available wherever books are sold globally uh, in uh, ebook or uh, hardcover or uh, paperback. Uh, Amazon certainly is a quick way to get it. Um, and uh, what else? Um, yeah, that's kind of where how people can track me down. You can learn more on my website. And uh, there's, you know, there's a form to fill out if you want the first chapter for free. I can, uh, I'll send that to you. Uh, all of the material that I have gathered, all of this blueprint material that I've gathered after you've read a higher road cover to cover and decided you're going to embark on this process. Uh, when that material is introduced, uh, as you go through these steps, then um, I uh, give you a way in the book that you can uh, 
get that material for free. Wonderful. I'm, I, I want to help people. So, uh, you know, my goal is to, I'd like, I wish everybody in the world would read my book and then make a decision for themselves. Mm. Mm. It's that, you got to have the knowledge first, right? Yeah. Well, that's it. I mean, well, they, well, they do say knowledge is power, I suppose, is if that's the right way of looking at it. Yeah. Is there a final message you'd like to leave with our listeners today? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, you know, I can tell you no matter where you're at healthy, uh, or ill, you know, wealthy or poor, happy or depressed, I can tell you that all of the safety, the security, the peace, the joy, the love that you seek, it's all within you. You just need to uh, gain the new knowledge and have the specific process to be able to gain access to it, unlock it and bring it into your life. And I can tell you, your life will change if you follow that process and you do it. And it'll be the most wonderful, beautiful experience that you have ever experienced in your life your life will totally change well there's a teaser for you yeah do it if you dare you know oh brilliant neil it's been an absolute pleasure having you on and we i've i could listen to you for hours and talk to you for hours you know but uh want to be respectful of your time you know so listen thank thank you for sharing thank you for being here i appreciate you and um until until the next time well, thank you so much, Pete. It's a pleasure to be here. And, and thank you so much for the conversation today. I, I very much enjoyed it. I appreciate it. Thank you.